The prominence of difficulty in video games has been a hot topic since its inception. From the obtuse yet simplistic design of the Atari 2600's inconsistent library, to the retro wars between Nintendo and Sega featuring astronomically challenging games marketed to an age group ill-prepared to handle them, to the internet's rise as a hub for sharing tips on those legendary challenges and flexing EPs once you'd bested them, to the modern age full of gamers who take on absurd challenges with thousands watching on the edge of their seat. No matter the era, difficulty always finds itself at the forefront front of the gaming world. The Oxford Dictionary defines the word difficult as needing much effort or skill to accomplish, deal with, or understand. Alternatively, it could be defined as characterized by or causing hardships or problems. Bridging together these interpretations of its meaning helps illustrate the fascination with difficulty as a concept. As humans, we have an innate desire to break the shackles of the adversity we face, to prove ourselves better than our supposed limitations. When we rise to the occasion, there's a level of euphoric response, a reaction that could be defined find as rewarding. When held back by the hardships we face to a degree we're unable to overcome them, there's a sinking feeling of oppression, a response that could be defined as punishing. Understanding the fascination with difficulty as it relates to games is deeply ingrained in these two emotional responses. Balancing the level of adversity placed on the player is a fine line for the developer to tread between punishment and reward. This trapeze that can make or break the value of a game to each individual player, all of whom have varying levels of tolerance in the face of hardship from a medium task first and foremost with entertainment. When difficulty is overly punishing, a game becomes frustrating, and therein fails to entertain the player. When a game strikes a perfect balance between challenge and reward, however, it can elevate a game's entertainment value astronomically. Today I want to show you why, when designed well, difficulty in games is a strength that can inspire growth. I want to show you the subtle line between games that reward the player rather than punish them. I want to show you why difficulty matters. In the modern era, there is perhaps no game more synonymous with the word difficulty than Dark Souls. Existing as a siren call to players seeking challenging solo experiences during a time when multiplayer shooters and dancing games dominated the sales charts, Dark Souls resonated with gamers for its unapologetic difficulty. Through an almost cult-like reverence of the challenge it offered, word of mouth slowly spread, expanding its reach. After six months on the market, it garnered just over a million in sales. Nearly a decade later, Dark Souls and its two sequels boast over 25 million copies sold. This success viewed in a vacuum can put emphasis on a simple conclusion. There's a market for games with difficulty as a single prominent selling point. Imitation is the most sincere form of flattery, and without fail, publishers look to ride this trend for a fat stack under the impression, if we make it hard, does anything else matter? As evidenced by the mediocre critical success many of these imitators achieved, the answer is an emphatic yes. Despite what these games lack against the rich ideas Dark Souls brought to the table in level design, character progression, boss mechanics, and environmental storytelling, discussions surrounding the game always round back to its difficulty. If all these excellent features take a backseat as part of a greater, difficult whole, it begs the question, what is so special about the difficulty of Dark Souls? Consider the ideas presented at the outset. By overcoming adversity, we are rewarded with an immense level of satisfaction. The phenomenon of Dark Souls' notorious boss euphoria is a perfect example. Watch any player conquer that one boss who's been destroying their soul for hours on end. That is pure bliss encapsulated in a single moment. And it's by design. I had no intention to make Dark Souls more difficult than other titles on purpose. It's just something required to make this style of game. Ever since Demon's Souls, I've been pursuing making games that give players a sense of accomplishment by overcoming tremendous odds. From the lead developer himself, Hidetaka Miyazaki never set out to make a hard game, but he understands the value players get from overcoming seemingly insurmountable challenges. With added context of the quality Dark Souls holds in the eyes of critics and fans, there's a deeper layer to this statement. Not only was Miyazaki's vision to create a world full of formidable challenge realized, it was done with a remarkable standard of quality. This blend of intentional obstacles and meticulous care put into every ounce of Dark Souls design was the genesis for its triumphant difficulty standard. To illustrate this masterful juggling act, let's consider Dark Souls' approach to progression within a level. 
The primary constraint against your ability to traverse the dangers of Lordran are your healing resources. The Estus Flask is your primary method of healing, a tool that has limited reserves. Within the levels of Dark Souls, you'll stumble upon bonfires. These bonfires not only replenish your Estus entirely, they can bolster its maximum charges through a small toll of your humanity. An item found throughout your journey, humanity can be used to kindle a bonfire up to three times. This progressively awards you with 10, 15, and eventually 20 Estus charges upon rest. However, the only path to kindling these flames is through becoming human yourself. Doing so will allow you to see the friendly spirits of Jolly Cooperation, in other words, the ability to summon players into your world. In turn, you are now subject to an invasion from bloodthirsty players who seek to steal your souls in humanity. If this all sounds like a terrifying trade-off, you can defer kindling a bonfire and consume humanity as a one-time full heal. If you think you can make it from bonfire to bonfire, there's no need for you to charge up a single flame, because your kindling is limited to that specific fire. You'll want to think carefully, however, due to the souls you carry. Every enemy defeated offers souls, Dark Souls version of experience and currency. If you die for any reason, including running out of healing and finding yourself exposed, you drop a mass of souls in a bloodstain. You have one opportunity to return to the spot you died and retrieve what you lost, lest it be gone forever. Every time you traverse the world of Dark Souls, you have to consider how long it will be before you find another bonfire. This decision impacts your willingness to proceed within a level. The gap between checkpoints is littered with dangerous traps and enemies. Dark Souls asks the players to learn the patterns of these enemies, the perils of the world they inhabit, and forces you to consider at every step whether it's worth turning the next corner or running back in fear of losing your souls. As you progress further and further, your knowledge of the level's layout increases, giving you an advantage over your adversaries. A surprise ambush that once killed you can be turned into an easy opening for you to attack upon repeat runs. Slowly you begin to remember the attacks enemies throw at you. You begin to learn counters to their many assaults, and the traps scattered throughout the level become little more than scripted events for you to scoff at. All of this is to say, Dark Souls rewards your time invested. The enemy placements, traps, and healing resources all crystallize as static quantities that gradually become more transparent. As the game throws new configurations, enemy types, and even bosses your way, you learn to adapt to the tremendous challenge the world offers. This is Miyazaki's vision realized, with an important caveat. Not only is a player subjected to intense difficulty, they're given resources, tools, and opportunities for growth that make this challenge feel fair. Estus and humanity are limited resources that can be relied on less when you invest in learning enemy placements and attack patterns. Proper exploration and study of the level's layout beyond this can make your journey more seamless through awarding new tools, shortcuts, and checkpoints. Bosses that cap your adventure through these areas are a study in action and response by the player, controlled entirely by how effectively you manage offensive and defensive gambits to claim victory. When you consider how well the majority of these elements are balanced, it opens the doors for them to be rewarding, win or lose. It may seem strange to suggest that losing could be enjoyable, but that's a result of the fair challenges rampant throughout Dark Souls' polished design. When enemies and bosses are crafted with a set of static rules, the player becomes the variable within the world. Your understanding of game mechanics, your study of enemy behavior, your implementation of character building, your dexterity, and reaction time. These all create a powerful presence in game that will be regularly antagonized by it in return. When games are balanced in a brilliant manner, self-aware players have room to admit that they are at fault and learn from these failures. The exponential growth resulting from these failures throughout your journey compounds your in-game presence into a tangible skill level, an imposing state that poses a rising threat to the game's overarching difficulty. In the words of the fans, you get good. Dark Souls encourages players who persevere past their mistakes by offering them a tremendous amount of satisfaction when they overcome the equitable adversity it provides. It's through understanding this relationship between well-designed hard challenges and the gratification it awards players that you see the value imitators so often miss. Dark Souls is not defined by its difficulty. It's defined by its ability to make difficulty rewarding. Dark Souls is far from the first notably hard game to accomplish this, and it won't be the last. Games like Hollow Knight, Bloodborne, Cuphead, Hyperlight Drifter, Sekiro Shadows Die Twice, Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze, Hotline Miami, and Dead Cells are all examples of curated, polished experiences rampant with high levels of challenge that are rewarding thanks to the fantastic balance in their design. This style of high challenge, shiny polish, big payoff game isn't representative of everyone's taste, however. There are plenty of gamers that don't want to be tasked with overcoming what can feel like daunting challenges, find the concept stressful regardless of how balanced they are, and would rather opt for what many would consider easy games. 
It's a patronizing designation, wouldn't you say? If you're unwilling to subject yourself to the high level of adversity imposed by a game like Dark Souls, why are you relegated to being someone who can't take the heat of a truly difficult experience? By my definition, difficulty done well emphasizes a perfect balance between challenge and reward. Consider an additional point made at the outset. Tolerance to adversity varies from player to player. While games like Dark Souls intentionally ask players to persevere through failure for a massive payoff, that's not a formula tuned to everyone's sensibility. That doesn't make the existence of these highly polished difficult games any less valuable for those it appeals to, but this brings up an interesting question for the inverse. If difficulty is a key factor in driving a game's quality, how does it manifest in these supposed easy games that appeal to a different demographic? To answer this question with integrity, consider the possibility that games of this nature are a mismatch for players that rely solely on dexterity and reaction time to achieve victory, or at least derive the most pleasure from games that challenge those qualities. Coming from someone who has beaten Dark Souls and its counterparts in ludicrous ways most wouldn't even attempt, allow me to share a game I find exceedingly more intimidating. The Sims 4. I cannot even begin to understand how the masterminds who pour thousands of hours into these games like it's nothing get out of bed in the morning without their real or metaphorical balls causing an earthquake. You think Artorias flying at you like a missile is terrifying? Nay, I say. Having six core needs all fluctuate between a daily routine that requires you to make enough money to properly meet them, house yourself with all the dang furnishings you naturally need, finding time for a compelling social life, and eventually add in a partner and children that you also need to manage requires a skillful balancing act that I find more daunting than facing Fume Knight with a ladle. You might think I'm being facetious, but no, I'm dead ass serious. While The Sims doesn't require you to react to Titans of Terror in an instant, it does require you to employ consistent problem solving, effective long-term planning, and resource management over hundreds of hours. These factors combine into an all-encompassing strategy throughout your playtime that requires as much cognitive skill as any use of physical dexterity. While you may not traditionally consider The Sims to be a difficult game, it is difficult for me. The sweet embrace of death in Dark Souls seems comforting when compared to creating a domino effect of existential crises throughout a Sims family thanks to my shortcomings. Okay, perhaps that's a bit melodramatic. A key difference in the way difficulty manifests in games that emphasize long-term strategy and resource management over spur-of-the-moment action is balance between punishment and reward. Although there are minor ways the game can punish poor planning, such as budgetary constraints or stagnating career advancement, these aren't devastating to the point it ruins your ability to enjoy the game. The game is forgiving to those who aren't skilled to juggling its many concepts, but if you're up to the challenge, you're handsomely rewarded for your mastery. This style of game offers exponentially greater satisfaction to those willing to invest wholeheartedly, offering near limitless potential for player growth. A shining example of this style of challenge lies in Stardew Valley. Tasked from the very start with nothing more than making the most of an inherited plot of land, the player has complete agency over how far they push the limits of its value. As you expand outside of your backyard, you'll bump into citizens eager to meet the newcomer, stumble upon a mine, a community center in need of refurbishing, all adding extensive layers beyond making a profit off your new acres. Though your farm is your baseline for success, the player is expected to learn optimal crop growth patterns by season while constrained by income and time. Choosing what crops to sell in exchange for more cash is key to ensuring year-long profitability. Don't forget to share some with the townsfolk though, all of whom have different tastes for the gifts you offer, whether they be crops or some treasure you found in the mines. They'll award you with recipes and random gifts that can help you along your way. You'll need it for the mines because it's Stardew's least forgiving area. They're full of mild dangers, but also crucial power-ups like increased daily stamina reserves that allow more actions in a single 24-hour cycle. Oh, that's right, keep in mind you aren't only constrained by the clock, but how much energy each action costs. There's fishing, a museum to contribute to, the allure of marriage, monthly mandatory events, the community center revival project, ongoing farm upgrades to allow for ranching, greenhouses for better winter crop yields, and far more than I could ever detail here year that all culminates in a two-year anniversary evaluation from your dead grandpa judging how effective you are at managing all of this equally to the tune of undisputed success. My short description barely scratches the surface of how complex these mechanics can be individually, let alone trying to prioritize them all against your converging priorities and resources. Every piece of Stardew Valley becomes an ever-shifting gear that can flow as part of a well-oiled machine the player orchestrates through calculated effort, or it can stagnate, providing you with gentle nudges toward more successful strategies in response. Despite the constraint of a daily clock, it's never intended to punish the player. Instead, it challenges you to make deliberate actions that consider the immediate, short-term, and long-term ramifications they'll have on yourself and the town at large. 
There's a consistent pressure on the player to succeed through minor decisions that add to a greater whole, to strategize beyond resistance to your goals, or in other words, the difficulty the game inserts to make your ability to plan and manage resources rewarding. Games like Stardew Valley and The Sims offer layered challenge, one that gives as much as you put in. The more ambitious your goals, the harder it is to plan and manage your resources to achieve that standard. Though they may not wear difficulty on their sleeve as loudly as others, it is an integral underlying factor that adds exponential value to these experiences. It's for that reason I have just as much respect for someone who can operate a seamlessly successful Stardew farm or family of Sims as someone who can beat the toughest challenges in a game like Dark Souls. They all demand different skills that are equal impressive. A comparison between which challenge is more monumental feels pointless. At the point of success, both players accomplished goals they set out to achieve despite resistance from the game. They both excelled in the face of hardship, rose above a challenge set before them, and proved in a tangible way how much stronger and smarter they've grown within that world. To the Sims maestros and Stardew experts of the world, you too got good. Time spent emphasizing examples of difficulty done to a rewarding degree is key to driving its value home, but I'd like to provide contrast with a game that manages to be neither punishing or rewarding. Devil May Cry 2 This game is accessible to anyone who can hold down a single button. No strategy necessary. His dual pistols are all you need to beat the majority of the game's content. There's an argument to be made that, from the ground up, you'll have a much harder time getting a perfect evaluation from Grandpa and Stardew than you will reaching the credits in Devil May Cry 2. With no semblance of balanced difficulty for the majority of its runtime, your only hope is to crank up that difficulty dial. But wait! The difficulty settings are locked behind beating the game not once, but twice with individual characters. A feat more impressive for your ability to stick through the mundane experience. The game offers no reward for time invested other than these new difficulty modes, the first of which doesn't even fix the number one problem, enemy resistance to your one-two bullet punch. There's little quick twitch skill necessary outside of some basic evasion, and there's certainly a lack of cognitive effort thanks to the one-note strategy involved. It's devoid of entertainment with its inability to balance difficulty in any sort of engaging way as a driving factor. This disappointing conclusion is the polar opposite of what difficulty settings can offer at their finest. Dark Souls and Stardew Valley both have high levels of focus in their difficulty. They ask players to identify and hone specific talents to make the most of their playthroughs. Standardized difficulty that is carefully designed by the developer forces players to adapt to that baseline, but there is a way to inspire growth while handing players the keys to the difficulty dial. While Devil May Cry 2 may be the perfect example of this done poorly, the remainder of its counterparts, particularly Devil May Cry 5, not only balance difficulty well from top to bottom, they encourage players to experiment, learn, and develop smoke and sexy skills through progressively more challenging modes. To support this claim, I submit myself as evidence, though I'll need to provide some background context. With many games offering a single curated level of difficulty, I'm left at a crossroads when faced with difficulty sliders for a boss ranking. Thanks to my initial growth on YouTube resulting from games that fall into the first category of game we discussed today, viewers often expect me to choose the hardest difficulty possible. With the main advantage of difficulty modes being wider appeal to a larger range of gamer temperaments, it's important that mine falls in line closest to the player average. With rare exception, I believe the largest number of players will choose the normal difficulty for their first playthrough of a new game. Since my videos reach thousands of people, it's important my experience stays similar to that baseline. Even more crucial is using this to standardize difficulty modes for the sake of comparison to other games without difficulty settings. When Devil May Cry struck my fancy for a boss ranking, I stuck to this methodology and played on normal. A few fans bemoaned my play in the first game not for my choice of difficulty, but my simplistic playstyle. Few were fussed about my steamrolling of DMC2 due to the aforementioned problems. When I came to the third game, however, fans voiced disappointment that my playstyle hadn't gone beyond spamming basic, repetitive attacks to win. In my eyes, as long as I came out on top, there wasn't a problem. Whereas the commenters were growing more restless to see me show off some style. Devil May Cry 4 was the breaking point. The game's introduction of a new character in Nero, with his charge shot revolver, the exceed revving Red Queen, and devilish Buster Arm, were completely irrelevant in the face of my blissfully ignorant approach to Nero's mechanics. At that point, series veterans were beginning to lose it, not only disappointed in my ability to string together a combo that made use of more than one button, but my lack of investment in learning basic mechanics like the Buster. Once again, I won. 
What's the issue? On the surface, there was none. I'm perfectly within my right to play the game however I please, and so are you. What I misunderstood was why there was an issue. Devil May Cry deviates from your typical hack and slash in two big ways. A combo system that scratches the depth of the fighting genre, and a style system to grade how well you differentiate your arsenal. As you battle, there is an ever-present grade for scoring your performance. The more you vary your combos and weapons, the higher it climbs. The bigger your grade, the more experience you receive. This system encourages you to try out every technique you can by rewarding you not only with in-game experience, but an opportunity for growth in the player's skill. Taking the constructive criticism of my playstyle seriously, I resolved to stop button mashing and bring on the stylish skill in Devil May Cry 5. Despite some initial bumps in breaking old habits, I slowly started racking up stylish combos. I found myself enjoying the game more. Way more, in fact. The joy of learning each character's strengths and testing how many of their abilities I could wrap into a single combo helped me adapt to the game's difficulty. Gone was a boring button masher, and in his place was a more adept orchestrator of the stylish combat. As a result of keeping an open mind to critical feedback, I got way more out of Devil May Cry 5 than I ever anticipated. I even revisited the game last summer to take on the game's Herculean hard difficulty. If you can believe it, I not only succeeded, I excelled. My willingness to adapt organically grew my skills to the point I didn't just beat Son of Sparta, I dominated it in smoke and sexy style. This is what the second game failed to provide that the fifth offers in droves. Difficulty modes designed masterfully not only to build upon each other like a steady crescendo, that gradual rise shapes the player into a badass fully prepared to conquer each new layer. The ground level provides an accessible experience to those who don't have masterful dexterity in reaction time. This forgiving floor encourages players to practice combo strings, juggle enemies, learn their patterns, and make the most of each character's unique abilities. As your skill increases, you may be tempted into a new difficulty. And as it rises, the game adds new enemy configurations to keep you on your toes. As you ascend to its most challenging heights, enemies and bosses begin banging their own devil triggers to test the absolute limit of your earned mastery. This defined progression path allows every player to avoid punishment by starting on their preferred difficulty, but rewards those who invest in the deep combat and style system by pushing their skills to new heights. It inspires you to new levels of skill and an addictive elevation that can end with players shattering their preconceived notions of what they were capable of. Another great example of this natural escalation is the Doom reboot from 2016. Coming from someone who grew up hardly playing any shooters, jumping into Doom was intimidating. Especially when you consider my lack of comfort with mouse and keyboard despite their precision, thanks to decades of playing exclusively on consoles. I should say my previous lack of comfort because Doom was a literal game changer for me. Starting on the Hurt Me Plenty difficulty, in spite of numerous suggestions to amp the difficulty higher, the normal challenge mode let me acclimate to the mechanics and controls. Slowly I left behind the coward hiding miles away with a pea shooter and embraced my new calling as a brutal force of nature, ripping and tearing my way through hell and back. The Doom veterans watching my playthrough on Twitch noted my gradual changes. I started rotating through weapons faster, mixed up my strafing patterns, and took greater advantage of the rapid movement options. By the time I reached the end, I said, screw it, I'm ready for round two. I went back and beat the entire game again on ultraviolence. Despite it pushing me far closer to my limits, my skills continued to evolve. This culminated in achieving flawless victory through all three of the final enemy waves to reach the end boss. These sequences are some of the game's most challenging, but thanks to my time invested in the game's natural ability to reward me for it, I was able to make clutch plays at key moments to push me over the razor-thin margins of victory. The boss euphoria I described in Souls is present in Doom as a near-constant adrenaline rush that boils hotter and hotter until its explosive end, a climax of rewarding emotions on par with my proudest gaming achievements. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. Through a question on Twitter, many of you shared examples of difficulty modes resonating with you in the same way. Horizon Zero Dawn's Ultra Hard Mode got a shout out for improving enemy aggression in AI without devolving them into bullet sponges. Kingdom Hearts got heaps of praise for a critical mode that breaks the mold of amping only enemy damage and gives you a power increase to match. The Last of Us Grounded Mode, Halo's Heroic and Legendary Modes, Bioshock, Borderlands, there were loads of games receiving positive acclaim from fans. The resoundingly high response rate this tweet received reinforced how much value difficulty adds to the games we play. In games traditionally heralded as hard, balanced difficulty can shift the emphasis away from cheap punishment and create a remarkably rewarding journey. Games commonly regarded as easy bake challenge into their design through tests of cognitive skill that offer just as much value as the traditionally tough. 
In between these ends of the spectrum lies a vast range of difficulty settings that, at their best, reign in design to guide players from beginners to legends that can conquer the game's toughest trials. None of these methods are designed to throw adversity at you in a punishing way. Instead, they encourage you to accept your failures as stepping stones to success. Carving your own path to this success in the face of tremendous odds is an influential experience I can only describe as rewarding. It's a journey that is unique to every player. One that makes it abundantly clear why difficulty matters. This is officially the longest it has ever taken for me to make a single video, so I really hope you enjoyed it. The topic of difficulty's importance in gaming is very special to me, as I know it is to a lot of you. So if you feel the same way, please spread the good word by sharing the video with a friend. Videos like this wouldn't be possible without your incredible support, so I want to thank you for watching today, much love to you, and I'll see you in the next video.